Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creed Pasta, and before we get started on tonight's video, I'm gonna tell you about chilling. I'm not even gonna straight up just say, look, it's chilling. Chilling is what I'm telling you about today because there's some new stuff, which I think is like really cool. I keep mentioning that there's ambient, right? I'm like, chilling, check out chilling. You can download chilling. There's ambient sounds, ambient music, you get to pick it. They have like music straight from Yuji that they, they commissioned to be done. But hey, now what's really cool, you have the ability to download for offline listening. So you don't have to be online all the time. If you guys are like, on a long road trip through the desert, which I don't, I don't know how often you do that, but I guess. But hey, you don't have to be connected to the internet. You can just download stories to the app and you're able to listen to it from there. There's over 700 stories, hundreds of hours to be able to listen to. And if you use my link, you can get a free trial and it's only like $2.99 a month after that, which is insanely cheap. So hey, it's friggin' great. Right now you can get a PS5. You go over to thechillingapp.com slash PS5 and you can be able to start your trial and enter to win by leaving a review. The winner of the PS5 will be announced on February 28th. So yeah, check it out. I'm really proud of it. I'm super happy to be involved there. And on to tonight's story. A couple years ago, I was assigned to stay on the ISS for a period of time. I got through the training without any problems. I was ex exhausted and I knew that the end goal was getting to spend some time in space. I was going out with two other astronauts I had previously spent time aboard the ISS. They had helped me in my training and I considered them friends by this point. I had a meeting the day before takeoff to finalize everything we needed to know. I sat there quietly, making mental notes of everything important that was said. The person leading the mission turned to me and started telling me that there was something that I had to be careful about. I was confused at first as to what he meant. He began to explain that there would be seven of us up there aboard the station, while showing us the pictures of the four other crew. He warned me that these are the only people that I should acknowledge while on the station. I shouldn't talk to anyone else if I hear someone outside the station begging to be let in. I should quickly do a head count before opening any hatches. I stood there with my mouth hanging open as the meeting continued. I laughed to myself after a few minutes as I thought that he just got me with an epic prank. The flight to the station was uneventful. I was proud of myself for actually making it into space. I knew that my father would have been proud of me as well. He always supported my dreams. I quickly got to know everyone on the station as we were in very close quarters. I remember gazing down at Earth I was shocked by how beautiful it looked. This was the greatest moment of my entire life. I woke up the next morning and immediately started prepping the equipment that I would need for the day. I moved to one of the main corridors and instantly froze. I was gazed at the man standing there. His eyes were blacker than anything I'd ever seen before. It seemed to somehow glow smiled at me, flesh on his face ripped open so that a smile went from one side of his face to the other. His teeth were bright red, they, they appeared to have faces of people screaming in agony. I floated there for a while watching him somehow stand perfectly still. One of the other crew came by and told me to stop staring at him, move away. I quickly came to my senses and I floated away as quickly as I could. I could feel his eyes peering at me as I moved away. The other crew members told me not to look at them. Just pretend like they don't exist. Next morning I woke up and froze in terror as there was now two of these creatures on board. They were beginning to follow me about. Any time I, I turned around they would be right behind me smiling away. Their flesh had begun to rot and I could see their insides were full of black slithering masses. I spent the rest of my time on the station, desperately counting the time down before I could leave. The creatures had multiplied. They couldn't leave me alone. I couldn't even look down at Earth anymore, as there would always be one of them looking in at me. I was ecstatic when it was finally time to leave, so I could finally get away from whatever the fuck was up here. The creatures seemed to look sad as I prepared to leave. They began to wave at me as I climbed aboard the shuttles. The bodies were now rotted that only the bones remained. I wept tears of joy as I finally set foot on Earth again. 
I swore to myself that I'd never go back to space. And if any of you have to go to the International Space Station, then don't look at someone who isn't one of the crew members. November, 1836. Finally, it's done. I sold my half of Van Draven and Morrison to my old partner and friend, Robert Morrison. He's now the proud owner of 20 of the finest clipper ships to ever sail from Southampton. May they serve him well in his future endeavors. As for myself, I am content. My new wife is young, beautiful, and the daughter of a wealthy planter, well established in the Jamaicas. Her heritage is old, almost as old as my own, if not quite as prestigious. Accompanying her is a maid, Matilda, a wild creature of mixed heritage. Dusk beauty indeed, who never leaves my wife's side. I believe my manservant, Stephen, is already in love. We count ourselves lucky to have such glorious company as we undertake the long voyage back to England. December, 1836. The new house is a marvel. Sat atop a rearing cliff, it overlooks the dark waves of the Atlantic and the picturesque village of Mavagazier, which sits nestled on the southern coast of windswept Cornwall. On our arrival, we were greeted by Jonathan Wills, builder and architect, who I had, at some expense, commissioned to build the house. After some pleasant trivialities, he took me gently to one side and explained to me some of the extra cost I had incurred during my long absence. Most of these seemed to revolve around compensatory-like matters, as it seemed two workers, both men from the village, had died whilst working on the house. One had died after falling from the scaffolding, and the other crushed to death by falling masonry from faulty rigging. Now, I inquired of Wills how this was any concern of mine. After all, the men had been hired legally and paid an honest day's wage for an honest day's labor. Any misfortune that had befallen them through accident, act of God, or their own carelessness was no concern of mine. It was at this point that I first learned of the village's dislike of not only myself, but also that of my new home. Wills informed me, in no uncertain terms, that it would be in my best interest and a gesture of goodwill if I was to compensate the grieving widows of both men. After some little thought, I agreed on the condition that he tell me what grievances the village and its denizens had against myself and my new home. He agreed and commenced with telling of his tale. According to Wills, the ground upon which my new house stood was considered by many of the villagers and others here and about the general area as something akin to sacred ground, something to do with an ancient druid grove and a a great circle of stone rings, both of which had been uprooted and destroyed to make room for my new home. The great stones themselves smashed and used in the very foundation of the house itself. This and more he told me until I could contain myself no longer and laughed uproariously in the poor man's face. After some small while I regained my composure and I apologized profusely for my rudeness, all the while explaining that the local fairy tales bothered me not at all. And the opinions of us, a bunch of superstitious locals, bothered me even less. But still, I had to live in this place and do business with the local shopkeepers and merchants. And so, I sent Wills on his way with a heavy purse with which to compensate the grieving families of the two men. January, 1837. Christmas was something of a muted affair. Many of my old friends and acquaintances are situated in London, and we are quite alone here in our own little corner of the world. My wife does not partake of strong drink, as is becoming of a lady. Now, she was somewhat silent and sullen through the whole affair. As for her maid, Matilda, she would not even acknowledge the sacred holiday at all, and I fear she's no true Christian. I stayed up late that night and drank deeply, lonely in my solitude. I even went so far as to drag my poor manservant Stevens from his warm bed before 
plying him liberally with generous amounts of my finest brandy. We sat there some time before a roaring fire, talking over old times while the wind howled and gibbered outside our window. The last thing I heard as I fell asleep was the roar of the ocean. I did not dream. March 1837 it's been four months and three days since we moved into the house, and although I have taken my beautiful Elizabeth to bed every night and performed my husbandly duties with great vim and vigor, there's no sign of a child. My beloved tells me these things take time, but I find myself growing more sullen, spending more and more time locked in my study poring over my old ledgers. My wife is strong, young, beautiful and almost twenty years my junior. I feel our troubles stem from myself, for I have grown old in many years of business, and now I fear shall never sire an heir to continue the sacred name of Vendraven. Oh God, save me from such a fate. April, 1837. The doctor I sent for arrived only yesterday, and after a lengthy examination of both myself and Elizabeth, and after many searching questions deemed us both fit and healthy, and could see no reason why children should not be forthcoming in our immediate future. September 1837. This summer was a glorious one, and I had almost forgotten this journal. Our days have been spent frolicking on the local beaches, where we picnicked and swam frequently in the chilly Cornish Sea. Our nights spent sipping wine on the veranda, listening to the gentle laughing of the surrounding sea, but, but for all our happiness and our nightly devotions to one another still, there is still no sign of a child. October 1837 God forgive me, for I have sinned. I have drank of vile potions, and I have prayed to dark gods, offering up sacrifice for their favor. It all started with that witch Matilda, who one evening, long after my wife had retired to her bed, approached me where I sat reading by lamplight in my study. She entered silently, and I only noticed her presence when she laid a dusky hand upon my shoulder, causing me to cry out and spill my drink on the book that I had been reading. Leaping to my feet, I cursed her roundly. She took a step back before my anger and curtsied, casting her eyes down demuringly. Yet still it seemed a small smile played across her shapely lips. I asked, uh, no, I demanded. She explained why she was sneaking around the house at this ungodly hour instead of attending her mistress, my good lady wife. She informed her mistress was abed and sleeping soundly, and it was now me she intended to serve. Now, baffled, I asked her meaning, but her next question caught me off guard. She asked how badly I wanted a child. And a male one, at that. An heir to carry on the Vendraven bloodline. For a moment I was tempted to beat her for her insolence, and even raised my hand to do so, but something in her eyes stilled my hand causing it to drop limply by my side. Anything, I answered. I would do almost anything for a male heir to carry on the Vendraven name. Nodding, she took my hand, and I marveled at how soft her skin was against my own as she led me from my study through the kitchen and down the darkened cellar. God, how to describe what waited for me deep in the bowels of my own home. An altar, an altar anointed with blood, a, a sacrifice to some dark and terrible god. Everywhere candles burned, flickering in the eyes of the dead animals that lay all about. Pigeons, doves, cats, even, even a large black dog lay piled around its base, their blood soaking into the feet of that terrible statue that sat hunched and grotesque. An insult to those of us who dwell in the same light of day. Its body, while hunched and twisted, resembled that of a man. But that's where anything human in likeness suddenly stopped, for its head was that of a great octopus, scaled with huge, staring eyes. 
and a mass of withered tentacles covering the lower half of its face. From its gnarled back sprung stunted wings, and its scaled arms and feet were claw-like and webbed. I turned to run to flee this abomination, but the witch Matilda stood blocking my way. I tried to push past, but she grabbed my arm and span me back around to face her, blowing some kind of noxious dust in my face that instantly caused my head to pound and sent my senses reeling. The next thing I knew, we were both naked, kneeling before the bloody altar. The knife was in my hand. God. Oh, God. Stevens lay dead before me. His throat a, a red ruin, his hot blood all over me. Beside me knelt Matilda chanting, her naked body covered in sweat and blood, as she cried out her devotion to her infernal gods. I tried to rise, but she pushed me back down upon my back and climbed on top of me. From behind her, she pulled a small wooden bowl, brimming with some kind of noxious liquid, which she raised to her lips. Taking the potion into her mouth, she pressed her lips against my own, but I twisted my head to and fro, raising my hands to beat her off, but she caught them easily and placed them upon her heavy breast, letting some of the crimson potion trickle from between her ripe lips down over her heavy, glistening body. In a moment, her lips crushed against mine spilling the vile poison down my throat. The rest of the night was filled with blurred images as we fornicated amongst the dead, like wild animals biting and tearing at each other, and I filled with all the vigor of my youth. Until at last I collapsed exhausted. Only to awake the very next day, battered and bruised in my own bed. So exhausted I was, barely able to move. I called out and my cry was instantly heeded as a smiling Elizabeth entered the room, carrying a tray as if she had been waiting just outside the door. She asked me how I was feeling as she placed the tray across my lap and told me how they had found me sweating and delirious upon my study floor in the grip of some strange fever. I tried to speak to tell her of the horror but I only managed a single word. Stevens. Smiling, she patted my hand. Her next words turned my blood cold. Sick, she lied. Smiling all the while. Down with the same fever as your own, my love. But don't worry, she said, beginning to spoon-feed me a strange-tasting broth. It will all be over soon. November 1837. Days have passed. Maybe even weeks. I am a prisoner laying here in this filthy bed, drugged and alone, only, only this journal to bear witness to my plight. The witch Matilda came to visit me yesterday, her belly already round and swollen. She took my hand and placed it on her stomach. What a fine son I will have, she grinned. A fine boy who will have a fine name and a fine fortune. A vessel for my master. For now his time has come round once again, and he will walk abroad once more in the land of men. And they will tremble at his coming, for the sleeper has awoken Lucas Vendraven. She stroked my brow almost affectionately and he will be of one father and two mothers, as it is written in the dark pages of time. I could do nothing but lay there and listen to her ramblings. She spoon-fed me the intoxicating broth down my throat, her soft chanting lulling me into a drug-fueled sleep. I awoke some time later in the dark. Perhaps only hours had passed, or, or even days. It's so hard to keep track of time in this place. The last face I remembered seeing was that of my once beloved Elizabeth, who sat silently by my side, spooning scalding broth between my lips, sometimes to smile at whatever little pain she could cause me. How glad I will be when you are dead, she said, 
ramming the spoon down my throat until I started to gag and choke. All those nights with your shriveled old body, sweating on me, grunting, how I shuddered at your touch, and still, you couldn't give me a child. Now Matilda has the honor of bringing our master into this world, but he's strong and will need two mothers, and I will feel his sacred touch, feel him growing inside of me, and after, when he is born into this world, I will come for you, Marcus Van Draven. She raised and threw back the scalding covers from my wasted body. She poured the remainder of the scalding broth onto my lap and laughed down at me, for I withered in agony before mercifully passing out. Later I felt a cold hand pressed against my throat as I swam up through the darkness. He is alive, the voice of Matilda chimed. You gave him too large a dose is all. That and the pain you have inflicted upon him. Why do we bother? Elizabeth replied. Let's just kill him and have done with it. Be silent, you fool, Matilda snapped. We still may have need for him. Should the ceremony go wrong, we will have to start the whole process all over again. Starting again, Elizabeth's voice sounded worried. As he is now, he can barely move, let alone give you another vessel for the master. Matilda laughed a throaty chuckle. I have potions that can rouse a dead man's passions. Have no fear of that. If all goes well tomorrow night, we shall have no more use for him, and you can kill him yourself. But until that time, leave him alone. No more of your little games. You promise? She asked, their voices moving away. That I can kill him? Faded now as they closed the door gently behind them. I knew then that I must find a way to stop them. Not only for myself, but also to prevent whatever evil they intended to bring into this world. God, I pray, give me strength. This will be my last entry in this journal. I awoke this very night to the roar of thunder and the flash of lightning outside my window. It seemed I'd slept the entire day away, uninterrupted, and I felt somewhat better for that. Faded was the leaden feel in my limbs, and my mind felt clear and sharp for the first time in many days. It seemed Elizabeth had heeded the witch Matilda's words and had left me alone, or perhaps they were busy with whatever evil they were planning, and they'd forgotten about me. Either way, my prayers had been answered, and I felt stronger than I had in days. Now free from the effects of whatever terrible drug they had been feeding me, rousing myself, I sat up, wincing at the stiffness in my limbs as I slowly rose to my feet, leaning against the bedpost as a wave of dizziness assaulted my senses. After a few deep breaths, the room stopped its spinning and I was able to gather my senses about me once again. Staggering over to my dresser, I quickly dressed before heading to the door. My hand had just started to turn the handle when the chanting started and suddenly the air felt charged with electricity, making it hard to breathe, causing my scalp to tighten and the skin of my arm to crawl with great knots of goose flesh. For a moment I considered running, leaving this place for the dam forever. But I, I could not. Whatever evil was afoot, I had played my part in it. For was it not my very essence that was being used, manipulated to bring something unspeakable into the world? Strengthening my resolve, I took a deep breath and I threw open the door, expecting to be greeted by all the denizens of hell, but... There was only a darkened corridor lit by flashes of lightning, crash of thunder that seemed to accompany the hellish chanting like some terrible drum. The air felt thick and heavy as I continued on down the hall, past the library and drawing room, till at last I stopped outside my wife's dressing room and, with trembling hands, threw open the door. They were both there, lying upon the floor facing each other, completely naked, their legs splayed wide open, their ankles entwined. The room was lit by hundreds of candles, and there was blood everywhere, 
It lay in puddles upon the hardwood floor and ran in rivulets down the walls. Even the ceiling dripped with a crimson rain, splashing and hissing against the burning candles, splattering and showering the two chanting women. I watched on in horror as Matilda's ripe stomach started to heave and twist. She had time to let out a single ear-piercing shriek before her stomach suddenly exploded, bathing Elizabeth's lower half in blood and gore as the creature inside her clawed and heaved its way out. I let out a wail of despair as the creature more fully emerged, for I had seen this thing before, carved in stone deep in the bowels of my own home. For this, this was Matilda's dark god brought to life by our terrible union, at the sound of my cry, Elizabeth noticed my presence for the first time, raised her blood-covered face and hissed at me, her eyes filled with hatred as if daring me to come closer. Now the creature was free and slowly crawling towards her waiting flesh. A laborious umbilical cord trailing behind it, eager to be in its new host, hidden away from the world where it can continue to grow and consolidate its power. Quickly, I looked for something, anything I could use as a weapon. My eyes fell upon a basket full of knitting. With a cry of triumph, I leapt forward and snatched up two slender wooden needles and ran across the room, but it was too late. It was too late, the creature was gone, hidden away, buried deep inside of my once beloved Elizabeth. Only the trailing umbilical cord remained. Stealing myself, I made a grab for it, snatching it up. At once my skin began to burn and blistered where the thing twisted and writhed in my hand. With a cry of fear and outrage, I heaved with all of my might, aborting the hateful thing back into the world. I did not stop or even think, but thrust the wooden needles down, driving them deep through the creature's strange flesh, pinning it in place. It let out a scream, a screech that only the true damned could ever muster, shriveling my poor, shrunken soul, reverberating through the halls of my mind. And then it lay still, the glow fading from its glaring yellow eyes once again. It cheated, banished back to whatever strange hell it had come from. Now Elizabeth was climbing to her feet. The master, she cried. Oh, Lucas, what, what have you done to our son? But I let her say no more. Grabbing her by the hair, I reached down and yanked the needles from our now dead abomination and thrust them upward under her chin into the soft flesh of her throat. Her eyes widened and she staggered back, gurgling and tugging at them, widening the wound till blood poured like a river down her body, mixing with the already blood-soaked floor causing her to slip and fall, sending her crashing into a nearby dressmaker's dummy, which she clung to, trying to find her balance, but it was too late. Her legs gave way, and she dragged the thing down on top of her, pinning her beneath as she convulsed and writhed, reaching out towards me, her fingers clutching, pleading, begging, but I... I turned my face from her. When I looked back, it was finally over. And so it's ended and only I remain. I've written all through the long night. At last the sun rises, driving back the darkness. But it can never drive away the darkness within the stain upon my soul. I shall go to the cliff's edge now. I shall take my only son and heir with me. Together we shall travel through the dark waters. May God have mercy on our souls. Eric Michaels didn't like the dressmaker's dummy as soon as he laid eyes on it. Then again, he was already prepared to hate anything his wife Sarah brought home from the Van Draven house. If ever there was a haunted house, a truly haunted house. The Van Draven house was it, the site of both multiple murder and suicide. It sat overlooking the village like some broken idol for nearly 300 years. The place was cursed, damned, and Eric Michaels wanted nothing to do with it. And he sure as hell didn't want anything from the decrepit wreck in his home. But when Sarah had heard there was going to be an auction there, 
She had promptly lost her mind and immediately called up her friend Marcia, arranging to meet at the Vendraven estate promptly at eight the following morning. Eric would well imagine them both sat outside the front gate like a couple of vultures, decked out in their best summer dresses, just waiting for the poor auctioneer to open the doors so they could sweep in, pick over the fallen carcass of the Van Draven house. In the end, she had returned with only two purchases, a dressmaker's dummy and a dusty set of crystal-cut wine glasses that Eric told her that he would never drink from. She had laughed at him then, calling him a superstitious fool before patting him fondly on the cheek and returning to the meticulous cleaning of her newfound treasures. Eric sighed and left her to it. It was all very well for her to call him a fool, but she was an out-of-towner from up-country, as the locals were fond of saying. Eric had been born and bred in Mavagezi. He had heard the stories passed on from generation to generation, had gathered in tents on many a Halloween night, and listened with terrified fascination as his friends and sometimes their older brothers told them gruesome stories of Lucas Van Draven, who had slaughtered his wife, unborn child, and even his new servants before throwing himself from a nearby cliff into the dark waters of the Atlantic. Stories of the Jonas family found dead in the basement of that house, their bodies twisted as if by some terrible force. She had never scurried past the house as a child walking home alone from school as the sunset made the cracked and shattered windows burn with a seemingly evil intent. Yes, the Van Draven house was as much a part of the village as the fishing boats in the harbor and the summer people who came to visit every year. One day, he supposed, when the old place became decrepit enough, they would pull it down and then all the evil things inside would rest. But for now, it still stood a monument to the madness, a madness that had now spread to his home. The first real argument started when Sarah moved the dressmaker's dummy into their bedroom. Eric had seen the god-awful thing stood in the corner of the large bay window next to Sarah's sewing machine and had promptly flipped out. There was no way that he was getting even one minute's sleep with that ugly-looking thing looming over him, but Sarah was having none of it. The whole thing devolved into a shouting match where Eric threatened to sleep on the sofa till that damn thing was gone, and Sarah storming out, telling him that he was welcome to it. She had left him sat there on the bed fuming, wanting to scoop the fucking thing up and throw it down the stairs but not quite daring to do so. Instead, he stood up and he slowly crossed the room, wondering what the hell she saw in something so ugly. The dummy was typical of its kind, legless, armless. It was nothing more than a headless torso impaled on a tarnished brass stand. The material covering the body looked to Eric like a light hessian, torn and ripped in many places. The overall feel of the thing was one of age and neglect. Curious now, he slid off the bed down to his knees and peered underneath looking for a date or even a maker's mark. What he saw there caused him to recoil in horror. The underside of the thing was covered in a dark maroon stain that could only be blood. Old and dry, but blood nevertheless. The bottom of the thing was covered in it drenched in it. Reaching out with a trembling hand, he touched the stains and was suddenly falling, the room spinning, disappearing as if he was being pulled down by some black tunnel. The room was gone, replaced by something else, somewhere else. All about him burnt candles, hundreds of candles and blood. There was blood everywhere. It lay in puddles upon the hardwood floor, ran in rivulets down the walls. Even the ceiling dripped with a crimson rain splashing, hissing where it made contact with the flickering candles, filling the air with its choking scent. Reaching down with a hand that was no longer his own, he pulled two wooden knitting needles from the abomination that lay dead at his feet and span about. 
A woman was climbing to her feet, quite naked and covered in blood. The master, she cried. Oh, Lucas, what have you done to our son? Again, that terrible hand reached out, grabbing the woman by the hair and thrusting the needles into the soft flesh of her throat. She staggered away, gurgling blood, gushing from her mouth as she tugged at the needle buried deep in her throat. Slipping, she cried out, grabbing a nearby dressmaker's dummy, clinging on for dear life, pulling it at her, raking it with her nails as she pulled it down on top of her, pinning her beneath. She reached out, begging, pleading, but he was going away now, back into the blackness, back to before, to now, to here, to this place. With a cry, he opened his eyes and yelled out in disgust. He was holding the dressmaker's dummy, holding it tight to his chest like some terrible dance partner. Thrusting it away, he backed up, trying to look everywhere at once. Dizzy, disoriented, he tripped over the corner of the bedroom rug, crashing to the floor, his head hitting the radiator with terrible force. The pain was blinding, turning his vision red, then... Mercifully, he passed out into blackness. He awoke two days later with 14 stitches and a bad concussion. Sarah had found him unconscious on the bedroom floor, his head laying in a pool of his own blood and had immediately called for an ambulance. He had only awoken once in the back of the ambulance as it rushed him towards St. Austell's General, but his words had been slurred and nonsensical, something about candles and blood before he passed out again. But now he was awake, doing well. His doctor had told him that he would be able to go to work at the end of the week, after a few days of observation. For the next few days, he lay there, the tedium only broken by meals and Sarah's frequent visits. At night time, he would lay awake, staring at the ceiling, wondering what he was going to do about the dressmaker's dummy. There was no way that he could tell Sarah what had happened. She would think he had hit his head a little too hard. Besides, she would never believe him, and who could blame her? He barely believed it himself. He knew only one thing. The damn thing had to go, but how to get rid of it? That was the question. He was still pondering that same question on the night that they released him from the hospital. It was 7.30 at night, and Eric was standing outside the hospital entrance, doing his best not to obstruct the automatic sliding doors that kept opening and closing, much to the annoyance of the on-call duty nurse at reception, as he tried to take shelter from the pouring rain. Sarah should have been here to pick him up over an hour ago, but she hadn't shown up. Worried, Michael rang the house, but the phone was engaged. He tried two more times with the same results before trying her mobile which rang for a couple of minutes, then cut to her answering machine. Eric had a sudden sense of foreboding, so strong that he actually became lightheaded, and nearly dropped his mobile phone as he leaned heavily against the side of the building. After a few deep breaths, he quickly dialed the number of their good friend and neighbor, Helen Daniels. Thankfully, she answered on the second ring, and was more than happy to go knock on the door and see what Sarah was up to. No, Michael didn't mind waiting. Michael stood there, sweating and listening to the silence for what seemed like forever, but in less than five minutes. Helen was back telling him yes, the car was still there, and no, no one was answering the door, and yes, it was locked, and all the lights were on. Eric hung up on Helen before she could start asking questions and called for a taxi. Less than ten minutes later, he was speeding towards home. Stepping out into a rain-soaked street, he paid the taxi driver and turned to face the house. Just like Helen had said, the car was still in the drive, and the house was lit up like a Christmas tree, with both the upstairs and the downstairs lights switched on. Feeling a little more relieved, Eric tried the front door, and finding it locked, just like Helen had said, he dug in his pocket and pulled out his keys. Stepping into the porch, he opened the door to the hall and suddenly stopped, his wife's name dying on his lips. The hall phone was hanging by its cord, 
gently swinging back and forth. Sarah's handbag was lying on the floor, its contents scattered and strewn all about the stairs. Jesus, God, the stairs. The stairs were covered in blood. It was spattered all over the banister, slowly running down the wall in rivulets, soaking into the carpet beneath. Hitching hardly able to breathe, Michael staggered back into the porch and vomited noisily into the corner. He stayed that way, holding onto the wall, sweating, shivering, until his stomach stopped its twitching and heaving for a moment. He considered just leaving. No one could lose that much blood and survive, but if there was a chance, even a small one, he tried not to think as he ascended the stairs, feeling the blood squelch under his feet. On the landing was one of Sarah's shoes. It lay on its side and was filled with blood. Eric's nerve broke, then he turned to run, grabbing onto the sticky banner to stop him falling headlong into the stairs. He was only halfway down when he suddenly stopped, reeling backwards. There was a woman at the bottom of the stairs. She was naked and covered in blood, a gaping hole in her throat. Michael screamed as he recognized the woman from his terrible vision. He tried to move, to run away, but he was frozen, unable to move. The woman started up the stairs, her eyes glittering like black jewels from the deep sockets of her eyes. Michael's looked on in horror as she smiled up at him, revealing rotting teeth from which dark blood now began to ooze. Letting out a cry of terror, his paralysis broke and he turned, fleeing up the stairs, past the bedroom door, meaning to lock himself in the bathroom, but suddenly... She appeared right in front of his face. Our son! She screamed, spattering his face with noxious blood. Terrified, half-blinded, he scrambled backwards, trying to wipe her vileness from his face. Screaming, she lunged forward, shoving him hard in the chest, sending him crashing through the bedroom door and onto the floor. His already battered head glanced off the bedroom table, and for a moment, the world darkened and he feared that he would pass out. Groaning, he raised himself up onto his elbows, trying to look everywhere at once, but the doorway was empty. Sobbing with relief, he clambered to his feet, ignoring the throbbing in his head. Suddenly, he was sure that she was behind him, ready to wrap her cold, dead hands around his throat, and with a cry, he spun around, his hands held high in a warding-off gesture, but the woman was not there. Only his wife, Sarah. For a moment, Eric Michaels was not sure what he was seeing. Then he began to laugh. The laughter turned into a scream, and the scream a shriek as he clawed at his face, at his eyes, desperate not to see, yet unable to look away. The dressmaker's dummy stood in its usual place, but now, now a bloody, crumpled figure lay at its feet, bone and sinew gleamed wetly under the merciful glare of the overhead light. The torn and battered body would have been unrecognizable except for Sarah's head, where it now sat atop the shoulders of the dressmaker's dummy. Her eyes rolled back to white, her blood-covered mouth wrenched open in a silent scream. The blood from the ragged stump of her neck ran down onto what was left of her tattered skin, which had now been stitched and sewn with crude stitches onto the dressmaker's dummy. As he looked on with horror, the whole thing began to vibrate, the empty arms starting to twist and turn, reaching out towards him. Still screaming, he started to back away. He heard laughter, then not with his own ears, but echoing round the broken vaults of his mind. And suddenly he realized Sarah's not poor dead lips were writhing, showing her bloody teeth. Her eyes now watched him, glaring at him as the vibrations grew stronger, getting closer and closer. The police found him there a few hours later. After an anonymous call, raving and ranting, his mind broken as he cradled the head of his poor murdered wife in his arms. As for the dressmaker's dummy, there was no sign. In the Van Draven house, time did not stand still. It crawled 
and undulated. In the library, ancient books tumbled from wooden shelves. In the hall, the sound of booted heels scrabbled on the winding staircase. In the kitchen, an ear-piercing scream followed by breaking glass, then stillness. In the silence, a grandfather clock ticked, and the house waited, and waited, and waited. James Monroe slammed the phone down with a curse and headed straight for the fridge. Wrenching open the door, he stared at the ice-cold beer. His face contorted with anger. Fuck it, he said, slamming closed the door and marching back into the living room. He stood in the middle of the room, his hands clenching and unclenching, with the need to lash out, to break something, anything. He stood that way for some time, his eyes closed, just breathing, until the anger passed and a great weariness fell over him, causing his legs to buckle, spilling him into a nearby chair. One beer, he thought, licking his dry lips. He'd do anything just for one goddamn beer. Yet he knew he couldn't do it. He had responsibilities. He had signed on with the NHS Ambulance Service at 8 o'clock that very morning, informing them that he was available as a first responder for the next 24 hours for Mavagizzi and the surrounding areas. A decision that he was now starting to regret. Talking to Marsha always left him feeling this way. Lonely, hollowed out, in dire need of a drink. God damn her. She had been nothing but a pain in his ass for the ten years they'd been married, and would probably continue to be so for another ten years to come. If it weren't for the kids, he would completely cut her loose. The divorce had been hard enough on the kids already. The mother using them like some kind of weapon. No, hostages to be dragged out like bargaining chips for her ever-increasing demands. Just then, the phone let out a shrill shriek, causing him to start from his chair. Angrily, he crossed the room and grabbed it up in mid-ring. James Monroe, he answered, twisting the cord between his fingers. Hello, James? This is Jane. There was no need for pleasantries or last names. James had been an emergency responder for over 15 years. He knew every dispatcher by name, if not by voice alone. Hello, Jane, he responded. What's your emergency? For a second, there was silence. Then Jane began to babble. Uh, I'm sorry, James, she said hurriedly, but I need your help. There's been some kind of explosion at St. Ostley's Brewery. All available units have been dispatched to the scene. Half the town is on fire. Then I get this call. Slow down, slow down, he said. Take a breath. Tell me what happened. Okay, she said, and James could almost see her pulling herself back together. The call came in about five minutes ago. A woman screaming about blood, begging for help for an ambulance, completely out of control. I just managed to get an address, then, then the phone went dead. Jesus, James replied, leaning heavily against the wall. Have the police been informed? You know we're not allowed to walk into any situation with unknown factors, or a possible crime scene. And besides, you know we only carry basic medical supplies. I have the defibrillator and oxygen, but they aren't going to be much good if someone's bleeding to death. I know, I know, Jane replied quickly. As for the law, Andy Clutterbuck is your local constable, has been informed and is on his way to the scene. It's local then? James asked. Here in Mavagazi? She said. Yes, up at the old Van Draven place, she said sounding more frantic than ever. James, please say that you'll help. The phones are ringing like crazy, and I'm here on my own. Sure, James heard himself say. Radio Clutterbuck and tell him I'm on my way. He hung up on her thank yous, but didn't move. His back pressed against the wall, his eyes tight shut. The Vendraven house. Mother of God, he prayed. Please don't let anything have happened up there again. Moments later, he was in his car. His medical bag quickly tossed in the back seat as he drove through the night-shrouded streets of Mavagazi towards the old Van Draven place. Yes, old, James thought, as he headed up the school hill. 
The Van Draven house was old, all right. Built in 1836 by Lucas Van Draven, the house was both the site of suicide, multiple murders, and madness. Even the foundations of the house were stained with blood. In 1832, while the house was still under construction, two workers had died. One after falling from rain-soaked scaffolding, and the other crushed to death by falling masonry. That had only been the beginning. Less than a year later, Lucas Van Draven had gone insane, slaughtering his servant, his wife, an unborn child before throwing himself from a nearby cliff into the cold embrace of the waiting Atlantic. The house had lain empty for nearly 20 years until it was purchased once again by Arthur Melingdon, a wealthy boatmaker who had retired in Mevagizzi to spend his few remaining years by the sea. He had been found dead four months later, hanging from a ceiling beam in what had once been Lucas Van Draven's study. After him, the Dorchester family had moved into the house in 1910, and had promptly gone missing. The house had stood empty then for nearly 60 years, cursed and shunned by all, until the Jonas family moved in. The husband had been a painter and decorator, who had holidayed in Mevagesi often and had finally decided to move down from Manchester to set up shop. He had seen the old Van Draven estate up for sale for an unbelievably small price and had immediately snatched it up, laughing at local superstitions and unconcerned by stories of its grisly past. He had moved his wife and two children right in and had started immediate renovations on the old place. At first, everything seemed to be going okay, and the village began to relax. Until the summer of 72, when the whole family was found dead in the basement their bodies torn and twisted, as if by some terrible force. And now, over 40 years later, another family from out of town had settled in with dreams of renovating the old place back to its former glory. James drove through the night towards the very same house, spurred on by a cry for help and blood-fueled phone call. For a moment he slowed down, his own terror almost overwhelming him, but it was too late. He had already turned onto Beach Road, the Van Draven house looming before him as he came to an abrupt halt behind Andy Clutterbuck's clapped-out old Nissan Micra. He just sat there then, head down, taking one deep breath after another, trying to get his swirling emotions under control before clambering out of the car, grabbing up his med kit, and reluctantly turning to face the Van Draven place. The Van Draven house was more than a house. It was in fact a small mansion set a little apart from the more modern houses of Beach Road, behind crumbling stone walls. It overlooked the dark waters of the Atlantic like some broken idol, a monument to both madness and murder. James started forward, squeezing through the rusted gates and suddenly stopped. The front door was hanging wide open. The house was almost in complete darkness except for what seemed to be a small light burning somewhere in the back of the house. Slowly, he approached the front door, taking a small torch from his jacket pocket. He clicked it on and flashed it just inside the hallway. Clutterbuck, he asked. You in there? But there was nothing. Only the sighing of the wind and the rustle of autumn leaves. Laying down his bag, he flashed the torch up and down the rotten plaster walls, looking for a light switch, but found only a square hole with some new-looking wires poking through, and guessed correctly that the new family, the Malins, he believed they were called, were having the old place rewired as part of their ongoing restorations. Slowly, he picked up his bag, trying to ignore how the light in his hand trembled, throwing long shadows as he stepped inside. It was the smell that hit him first. The smell of decay, of rotting plaster, mildew, old black mold. They wondered how anyone in their right mind would bring their children to such a place. Hello? He called again. But there was still nothing, only the same waiting stillness. Creeping forward, he walked down the hall until it opened up into a large marble room with winding staircase that led up to an unseen balcony on the house's second floor. To his right, was a large, ornate wooden door from which a dim light burned beneath. 
With an arm that seemed to stretch for miles, he slowly pushed open the door. The room he stepped into was a complete contrast to what he had seen in the rest of the house. Here, the walls were freshly plastered. The wooden floors swept and buffed down to a mirror shine with thick new rugs as a makeshift carpet. In the corner, rolled neatly away, were four sleeping bags, two large red and blue and two small, one pink with unicorns and another blue with Thomas the Tank Engine. By the boarded-up window was a mini DVD player and a two-ring camping stove. And James surmised that the family were living out of this single room while the renovations were getting underway. Hello, he called, unnerved by the silence. Is anyone home? Uh, ambulance service. He was answered by a muffled groan coming from a so far unnoticed door. The noise came again and he hurriedly flashed his torch around until he found the door and quickly pushed through, his fear forgotten as his medical training kicked in. The room he found himself in had at one time been a sort of kitchen or preparation area, and like the other room, was in the middle of being renovated. Some of the worktops and cupboards were brand new, but the walls were still covered in rotten plaster and broken kitchen tiles. James flashed his torch around, looking for someone in distress, perhaps slumped in a darkened corner. His light flashed across the floor, and he took a sharp intake of breath. There was blood here. A long smear of it leading to a small wooden door built into the back of the room that now stood slightly ajar. As James approached, he noticed a yellow flickering that caused small shadows to dance and undulate in the doorway. Hello? He croaked, his mouth suddenly dry, his tongue feeling large and swollen. Ambulance service! He was on autopilot now his legs carrying him forward as he pushed open the door, revealing the wooden steps, slick with moss and cold earth walls, running with moisture. He was halfway down when the smell hit him. A harsh, coppery smell like pennies, held too long in a tight fist. And suddenly his fear, which had sat like a cold stone in the pit of his stomach, overcame him. The flesh in his arms started to crawl. As the hair on the back of his neck became erect, his whole body breaking out into great knots of goose flesh. He would have turned to flee, but his will was no longer his own. As he reached the bottom of the stairs and turned the corner, Andy Clusterbuck sat naked in the middle of the room, naked and covered in blood. He was surrounded by candles that cast dancing shadows all about him. As James watched on in horror, Clusterbuck raised a large carving knife and began to carve the skin from his face. He let out a sort of groan as he ground the tip of the blade under his eye and drew the knife downward, splitting his cheek, revealing the bone beneath. He saw James and grinned through bloody teeth. He killed them, he said, pointing at the bodies all about him. They tried to hide it from them. But he dug it out of them using this. He raised the bloody knife. He told me a secret before he cut his own throat. He told me that there's something buried here, something that burrows and worms itself inside and hides, but I'll find it. You can help me find it, he said, driving the knife through his cheek. We, we can find it together. James turned then. His paralysis broken, he fled screaming up the steps, his bladder letting go as he screeched and gibbered, stumbling and falling through the Van Draven house, which now seemed to be coming to life all around him. From the shadows, faces loomed, some laughed, others screaming. Blood-curdling shrieks of agony echoed through the broken caverns of his mind, and somewhere, far away, a baby cried and a woman screamed her denial and terror. He burst through the front door, escaping the reaching shadows and fled, stumbling into the night. Overhead, an uncaring moon sailed over the now silent Van Draven house. Inside, mice scurried through the walls. The floorboards creaked and dust motes stirred as if moved by some unseen presence. A grandfather clock chimed softly. 
and the house waited and waited and waited. After sparkling parmesan over the mouth-watering chicken and spinach tortellini I just made, I scraped half the dish into the sink and turned on the garbage disposal with an irritated sigh. I hated having to throw half of it away each time. The only reason I moved into this apartment was because rent was cheaper after I'd lost my job and nearly burned through my meager savings. It definitely wasn't the suffocating ambience and the sketchy neighborhood and it most definitely wasn't the meal prep boxes left daily at my door. I only learned about those when the previous tenant visited me. Lita dropped by the very same day I moved in. After pointing out the leaky corners I should avoid, suggesting affordable roach traps and teaching me how to lock the window with a broomstick, she mentioned the boxes. Now, I thought she was kidding, but she was dead serious. I had to prepare dinner each day, dump half in the garbage disposal, and eat the rest right away. She seemed so nonchalant about it, but I, I wasn't. Who was sending them? Why? What would happen if I refused? She had no solid answers. All she knew was what the previous tenant had told her, which is what they were told by the previous tenant, and so on. Origins unknown. Even the landlord had no idea this was going on, and Lita stressed that I must never tell him. She also stressed that I must never refuse. Why? She said, protection. Claiming that for as long as she'd lived here, the apartment was never robbed. Was she seriously insinuating that this stupid requirement protected her? She shrugged and said anything was possible. She didn't question the absurdity of it all, but she did question my reluctance. She assured me that she'd eaten from the boxes every day for the year that she'd lived here, and they were legit. No prank, no poison, no strings attached, just dump half in the garbage disposal and eat the rest right away. She began listing the various meals that she'd prepared, and my empty stomach growled. I hadn't had a decent meal in days. It didn't take me long before I caved. Now, after a month of delicious food, my unease was ebbed but not my disdain. After I turned off the garbage disposal, I grabbed the remaining chicken and spinach tortellini and I plopped down onto the floor, eating my only meal today. And despite licking the plate clean, my stomach still complained and I glared at the sink. Half a portion wasn't enough. And I was sick of wasting part of a perfectly good meal. One that I'd worked hard on, no less. I was done following these ridiculous rules. Tomorrow, I was going to eat the entire thing. And I did. For the next week, I prepared and ate the whole meal, and nothing happened. I'll admit, I was nervous the first few days, but when the world didn't collapse and the boxes kept coming, I felt pretty clever for being the first to break this ridiculous and wasteful trend. As long as food kept getting delivered right to my door, I was going to eat it. I was, I was going to eat all of it. Eight days later, I realized my actions should have killed me. My bladder woke me up that night, and I shambled to the bathroom. After washing my hands, I made my way back to my sleeping bag, and I, I frowned at an unusual draft. Before I could figure out where it was coming from, a startling force knocked me to the ground. My heart leapt to my throat, and it probably would have jumped out of my mouth if there wasn't a hand smothering my scream. The stench of sweat filled my lungs as I struggled beneath a bony weight, my panicked thoughts flashing horrifying scenarios through my mind. A sharp hiss for silence pierced my ears as the cold metal of a gun pressed against my temple, and I abided. Trembling face down on the floor, I held my breath my eyes wide in fearful anticipation as I heard my attacker grunting and rummaging. I turned my gaze to the open window and I cursed myself for not propping the broomstick properly as I saw it lying on the floor. In no time, the intruder had shoved a filthy rag in my mouth and yanked my arm behind my back, binding them before he lashed my ankles together. Only then did he take his weight off of me and flip me over, sunken eyes, wild under a mess of hair. He's definitely on something. It was frightening. His actions had no hesitation. 
He came here for something, and he wasn't leaving without it. The question was, what? That mystery didn't last long as he demanded to know where I hid my valuables. I stared at him in disbelief. Did he not see the squalor I was living in? I didn't even have furniture. Did he think I had cash stuffed in my frayed sleeping bag? Gold hidden in my rusty oven? Diamonds stashed behind my broken radiator? My baffled silence wasn't the answer he was looking for, and I cried out as he punched me in the face. He lifted his fist again, and I flinched, whimpering through my gag as I nodded towards my meager possessions, my wallet, and my phone. He crawled over to them, and I crawled away, tears stinging my eyes as my cheek throbbed to the rhythm of a shuddering heart. It was certain $11.25 and a phone with a cracked screen wouldn't be enough to appease him. He seemed desperate, desperate enough to kill. I had to save myself before it was too late. As he tore through my wallet in frustration, I made my way to the kitchen. My eyes on the drawers. I, I just needed a knife to cut through these bonds and I could, I could make a run for it. Balancing on my knees, I bent over and I reached up with my hands, my trembling fingers searching for the handle, gripping it. I pulled, but it didn't move. It's the worst time for it to stick. I wiggled it as I always do, but my position was less than optimal and the drawer refused to budge. After a particularly forceful yank, I lost my balance and I fell with a grunt. My terrified eyes turned towards the door as the intruder stomped in, gun aimed at me. I screamed and cowered against the cupboards, my heart slamming against my ribcage as the blood drained from my face. And then... The blood drained from his face. I followed his petrified gaze and I screamed even louder as an unholy creature erupted from the sink. It towered over us like a giant furry centipede, pointy legs bristling from its long, inky body and spikes jutting out of its mouth. With a lurching motion looking almost as though it was falling, it descended upon the intruder, silencing his screams with a stabbing straight through his throat. It didn't silence my screams, though. And I continued to shriek through the gag as the monster continued to stab the man, his sharp legs jabbing at him like a macabre typewriter. It was facing away, but that didn't stop the spraying blood from dotting every surface of the kitchen, including me. After a final few jabs, the monster stopped puncturing the intruder, and I watched in horror as it began sliding the mutilated body into its mouth, its legs tapping against the cracked tiles with excitement as though this was the first meal in ages. It devoured its kill the way a snake would, completely whole, and vomit fought my screams as it burned my throat. Once the last of the man disappeared, the creature gulped a few times and began spasming. For a few moments I thought it was choking and dying, but to my terrified dismay I realized it was crushing the body within its own as I heard bones snap and grind. Its convulsing stopped, and shock stole my screams as I watched its sharp legs retract into its blood-soaked fur. It now looked more like a giant fluffy caterpillar than a centipede and my raspy breaths raced my pulse as I fearfully waited to see what it would do next. I stared in fraught disbelief as the monster began slithering across the floor, lapping up every last drop of blood it came across before it stretched itself to reach the counters, the walls, the ceiling. It was a lot more coordinated after eating, and that amplified my unease. Soon, only my corner was left, and it turned to me, giving me my first clear view of its face. It wasn't what I expected. I'd imagined pincers, antenna, a compound eyes, but instead I saw, I saw a rounded snout, floppy ears, and deep scars where its eyes should be. I mean, in any other scenario, it might pass for cute, but right now, all it did was reboot my vocal cords as it slithered closer. My muffled screams echoed as I pressed myself against the cupboards, petrified, but he didn't seem to care as it licked up the blood around me. And when it began licking me, my heart almost stopped beating right then and there, as I was certain I was next on the menu. And then... It nuzzled me. I peeked through my eyelids, gulping, and I frowned in uneasy confusion as it curled up beside me, laying its large head on my lap. Slowly, I allowed my screams to stop, my tense body quivering with adrenaline. It had murdered my attacker, cleaned up the crime scene, and now it was 
it, it was snuggling. A knock on the door startled us as my neighbors asked if I was alright and I gasped, afraid the monster would go after them. To my surprise, it shrank away instead, slithering towards the sink and stretching itself thin before wriggling down the drain. The door crashed open, and my neighbors ran in, the look on their faces matching mine as they saw me bound in the corner, quaking with shock, and after that, they freed me and I, I found my voice. I mentioned the robber, but I gave him a happier ending as I claimed he ran away. As much as the creature terrified me, it saved my life. I didn't, I didn't want to get it in trouble. Besides, who would believe me? Maybe Lita would. I decided to call her in the morning, but that left me up all night thinking. Was that creature the thing that we'd been feeding all this time? Was Lita right? Was it here to protect us? Was it too weak to scare off the robber before he attacked me because I'd unintentionally starved it over a week? And despite all that, did it care for me that much that it didn't eat me? It saved my life, and, and, and it snuggled? I hope that was the case. The creature didn't seem malevolent towards me, but there were still many unanswered questions and uncertainties, and I hope Lita would answer them. She couldn't. I mean, I didn't mention the monster right away, afraid that she'd be clueless and think I was insane. Instead, I asked if she knew what was protecting us, and if anything unusual slithered out of the kitchen sink. She said our daily ritual protected us, a modern version of ancient sacrifices to the gods, and then, then she suggested that I ask the landlord to fix my past issues. I still have no answers. Too poor to leave the apartment, not willing to tempt fate. I decided to continue dumping half the meal in the garbage disposal. If, they, if that creature was going to protect me, I'd have to stay on its good side. Next day, I carried the box to the kitchen, pinned the recipe in my fridge, began preparing a spicy salmon pizza, keeping a wary eye on the sink. As I turned to the recipe, running my fingers down the instructions, it slipped from beyond the magnet and fell to the floor. This happened every once in a while, but this time, the glossy paper disappeared beneath the fridge. Now... Not willing to stick my hand under there, I grabbed the wire coat hanger, stretched it out, and began fishing. I received the medley of cereal crumbs, fossilized, chicken wing, a pen cap, a used car salesman business card, two dead roaches, my recipe, and a strange yellowed paper. Curious, I dusted it off and read it my eyes expanding with every word. December 11th, 2013. Dear Tenant, I moved into this apartment to care for my savior. I was a hunter, you see, and I had terminal cancer. I was reckless, and I didn't care when death would choose to take me. But... Alesta cared. She protected me when I challenged a bear appearing out of the blue and nearly dying herself. No one had ever done for me what she did, and I was moved by her selflessness. Alesta got injured and lost her eyesight. She was no longer able to hunt, and I felt responsible. I invited her to live with me. With the last of my savings, I signed up for ten years of a meal prep program. I know I won't live that long. She may not either, but I still ask you, dear tenant, to continue honoring her. Every evening, prepare the meal and leave it in the cupboard under the sink. Then go to sleep. The next morning, if the plate is still full, do with it as you wish. If the plate is empty, don't be alarmed. Just continue to honor my savior, and you'll be safe and secure as long as you live here. Dear tenant, this is all that I ask of you. Fulfilling a grateful man's dying wish. Please don't mention this to anyone, especially not the landlord. But if you end up moving out, please hand this letter to the next tenant. And when the ten years are up, on December 11th, 2023, please, my friend, consider renewing. Alesta deserves it. Thank you, and be blessed. I put the letter down, stunned. The creature truly was a protector, Alesta. 
brought here to be cared for by a man with little time. Callum put a lot of faith in a bunch of strangers, but I guess he didn't have a choice. He could have at least told us what we were dealing with, but maybe he didn't trust that we'd have Alesta's best interest at heart. I was surprised that we'd all followed the rules despite how cryptic it was. Well, at least until... Until I came along. He looked at the letter again. Would I have been more inclined to abide if I had received this? I mean, I'll never know, because one of the previous tenants misplaced it and passed on the message verbally, the request changing from person to person like a game of telephone until we were feeding Alesta half her intended meal through the garbage disposal. That wasn't going to happen anymore. I didn't want Alesta to hide anymore either. She saved my life, and I wanted to improve hers. After preparing the spicy salmon pizza, I placed it on the kitchen floor and sat cross-legged in front of it. Working up the courage, I cleared my throat and called out her name. Uh, Alesta? A soft gurgle sounded from the drain. Uh, Alesta, dinner? Uh, food? Yummy food? I'd never met a creature like Alesta before, and I had no idea how intelligent she was. Hey, come out, it's okay. You don't have to eat in the drain anymore. You can live out here. With me. I held my breath as she poked her head out of the sink. Her nose sniffing the air. Hey, Lesta. She gurgled again. She seemed to like hearing her name. The one her only friend had given her. Well, well now she had another friend. I gestured to the pizza and smiled before I remembered she couldn't see. This pizza's all for you. I looked down with regret. Sorry I didn't feed you last week. I'll never do that again. I couldn't help but tense up as she slithered over, her long, slender body compressing into a bulbous form as she settled in front of me. This is gonna take some getting used to. She smelled like rust and old lettuce. I hope she wasn't averse to baths now that she didn't have to hide anymore. Two pointy legs protruded from her fur, and they poked around blindly until they found the plate. I watched in surprise as she split the pizza and slid half over to me, and I pushed it back. No, no, it's all for you, like Callum wanted. As I said that, my stomach growled, and Alesta chirped in response and slid half towards me again. She picked up a slice and began nibbling, and I smiled teary-eyed as I reached out for my own slice. For the first time ever, I was... I was... glad that I'd lost my job. But once I got a new one, neither of us would ever go hungry again. Entry 1 I've decided to keep this journal until I'm saved. Today is Monday, 8-25-2014. I'm currently stationed on the USS Kentucky as a Navy seaman, or uh, it was, as the ship has sunk. I don't know the reason why it went under. My officer gave me duty below deck. I was doing a quick inventory of the supplies in one of the storage rooms. There was a loud crash of some sort, and the ship shook violently. I was trapped under a closet that fell over during the crash, and the door closed itself, the automatic lock activating. Being trapped under a closet, in all honesty, I was slightly panicking. Alarms are going off. This wasn't how I imagined my morning going. Okay. I knew being stationed on the ship was bad news since I received my orders, but what I heard, the champagne bottle didn't even break during the christening, which, you know, which means bad luck. No amount of successful missions could have convinced me otherwise. I hate being right. The crash happened a few hours ago, but the ship... The ship's going down fast. I haven't been able to unlock the door from the inside, so for now, I'm trapped. Some of the flooding compartments have been closed off to prevent the sinking of the ship. Sadly for me, it did fuck all. It just means that I'm well and trapped here. Luckily, there's enough food and water to last me a few weeks. I mean, I hope at least. In all honesty, the main reason why I'm writing this down in some scraps of paper is to keep myself calm... See, if I start to panic, I'll... I'll waste oxygen. There's no way I have enough to use 
all the food here and the water if I hyperventilate. Entry 2. I managed to find a flashlight and a few batteries, so at least I can see my metallic prison. There's no way the military isn't looking for me right now. The captain must have sent out a distress signal or it happened automatically. They're on the way to save me as I'm writing this. But as the ship is sinking deeper and deeper and the loud groaning of the metal around me isn't giving me any hope, that it'll, it'll be an easy operation for them. For now, all I can do is wait. Of course. Tried banging on the walls and the doors to get some measure of attention, but I guess... Also panicking. Didn't hear me or something. I mean, they'll notice that I'm not there during the head count. They have to. Maybe the captain even brought a radio to the escape boat. I'll be, I'll be out of here before I know it. Yeah, enough writing for now. There's so little happening, there isn't much to write about. I mean, maybe I could write a book about this. Become famous like that... Like that guy who got his hand stuck in a cliff. Entry 3. Damn, I need to figure out how to keep track of time down here. Some things happen, but it's hard to get a frame of reference. The ship's taking on more water, and it's... falling towards the bottom of the goddamn North Atlantic. But I'm still trying not to panic, right? But with the water around me, it's becoming slowly darker and darker. So it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to manage right now. It's about pitch black out when I... Look through my window. It's hard to it's hard to see out far. If I were to guess, I'd say that ship's about 2,000, 2,500 feet deep. There's still some sunlight coming through though, but it's not nearly enough for me to see. The ship's still still creaking. My little steel room is damaged and all. Water will enter. I'll be fucked. Man, that doesn't happen. Entry four. Must have been a day by now, right? Heard another loud crash, I'm guessing it was a few hours ago. It's hard to know just how long ago, with the sunlight completely gone from this depth. Either that or it's nighttime. The adrenaline's kept me up for so long, but with that comes the hunger. Eaten way too much of my supplies already. Although on the bright side, I managed to keep myself calm the entire time in order to preserve as much air as I can. Having a plethora of breathing exercises are actually helpful, I mean, who knew? Absolutely no idea how long I can last with what I have, and I can't exactly try to open the door either. Can't know the situation on the other side of the door at all, so... I only have the air in the room right now. I just hope the rescue mission is on their way already. It's quiet down here. Entry 8. Fuck, this is maddening. You know, waiting down here is so boring. You, you think that that'd be the least of my concerns, but I feel like I've been down here for days. No changes, no sounds. I haven't begun talking to myself. You know, just, to, just to hear something other than the creaking of what's presumably left of the hull. I have counted, counted an inventory a hundred times by now. Found some flares. Thought about using them to start a fire, but it would just waste the precious oxygen in here. Though sometimes past, I'm... I'm not feeling lightheaded, right? I keep I keep movement to a minimum and the cabin's completely dry. There is, however, a problem with the cold. You see, like, with no sunlight coming down here to warm the water. It's it's definitely been a few days, you know, at this point, so so I must be below the level where the light can reach me. The cabin's become become increasingly cold. Found some blankets, I'm using them to keep myself warm. I need to resort to using flares if this keeps up. And there's no point in saving oxygen if I freeze to death down here. Your rescue's still coming. Right. Entry 10. Yet another problem to add to my increasingly big pile of shit. So literally, this time, so where am I supposed to piss and shit? I mean, I can't, I can't go to the, I can't go to the goddamn bathroom. I chose a random corner in my cell, which began tilting afterwards due to some fucking oceanic current or something. So, so the shit smear is, is spread nicely around the goddamn room. On top of that, the can I was using to piss in also fell right over. This place smells. It feels gross. For fuck's sake, guys, come here and fucking rescue me. I can't do close to anything at this point. Entry 13. Please, guys, please come soon. I can't stand it here anymore. One of the pipes began leaking and it, it, it hasn't stopped. It's constant dripping now. It feels like 
It's like Loki, when Odin finally had enough of his shit, punished him by chaining him underneath a snake so that it could drip poison on his bitch ass. And the only two differences. Firstly, I don't have a wife to catch the drops and make it stop making the noise. And two, I'm, I'm innocent. Okay, I I did nothing to deserve being down here. What what did I do? Tell me, I'll I'll stop. Just let me out of this watery prison. Just drip, drip, drip. I'm losing my fucking mind. It's been going on for days. I haven't been able to sleep at all because of it. It's cold. I'm miserable. There's nothing to do except write, but there's there's nothing to write about. Entry 15. I don't think they're coming anymore. I only have a few sets of batteries for my flashlight, so... I've been using them extremely sparingly lately. I I found the box. said the flashlight should last about 55 to 60 hours on low, which is what I've been using and doing the math in my head with some pretty heavy guesswork as well. I came to the conclusion that I've been down here for nearly two and a half weeks. Give or take a day. There's still plenty of food. There's water. I think oxygen, but what if they don't find me? What am I holding on for? I feel lonely out here. Back on the ship, I used to love staring at the night sky on deck, you know, the stars above you, the ocean. It it gives off a feeling of immense loneliness. It's a feeling that you welcome if you're on a ship. You know, you're always, you're always surrounded by people, constantly in communication with them. The nights on the deck were amazing. Up north here, you, you could you could see the aurora borealis in winter. Well, that was some months ago. Now though, now now I miss the constant chatter, the people surrounding you, good ways of distracting you from how truly quiet the ocean actually is. I mean, sure, when you wanted to sleep back on the ship, you'd complain about the sounds of waves hitting the hull or the, the wind rushing outside, but compared to the people, it may as well not exist. Now I'm here. Alone. Only sounds I hear are the, the currents hitting my prison. It's usually drowned out by the dripping. Goddamn dripping, it's maddening entry 18 who knows where I am I can't have drifted too far as I sank I haven't heard too many sounds that might indicate movement pipes still dripping with water the amount of dry floor space I have is shrinking day by day I fear the hole's gonna rip at some point flood the entire room with that freezing water I made a fire by lighting some wood from the crates with a, a flare and to keep myself somewhat warm. Doesn't do much. It's enough to make for some relative comfort. If only I could sleep. Constant dripping sounds keeping me awake most of the time. I feel like I like I haven't slept for days. My only fear is I run out of oxygen really soon if I keep the fire going. I only use it when it's too cold to bear. Entry 19. A sound. I, I, I hear a sound. It's, it's some clicking noises that sound like the Geiger counter you hear in a, fa- in a Fallout game. I don't know what it was, but at least I'm not alone, right? I actually forgot what it's like to hear something aside from the dripping and the, the sounds that I make. It sounded far away, but the creature must have been huge. Maybe like a, a whale of some kind or something. I'm, but I'm not, I'm not alone, right? That's the most important thing here. Couldn't possibly imagine what it's like to hear nothing but your own heartbeat and a constant dripping. (laughs) What makes it worse is the feeling of being alone. You know, so alone. In fact, that I... That I began speaking to the dripping sound. Even giving... Even giving it a fucking name. Mr. Drip. I feel like that man from, from Castaway, right? But at least he had light. I'm fucked. 
Mr. Drip is an asshole who doesn't know when to shut up. Entry 22. Whoever said stare into the abyss, the abyss will stare back. Never truly had to stare at one. See, the fear of the dark isn't actually fear of the dark, but instead fear of what's inside that darkness, right? So let me tell you, I've been staring at the darkness outside my little window for days. Trying to look for any sign of life ever since I had heard these sounds a few days ago. I don't know what to expect, but I welcome anything at this point. See, the Norse used to have stories about the Kraken. On old maps, they used to say, here be dragons, referring to the middle of the ocean, other uncharted territories. Even, even in the Bible, when you talk about Leviathans in the Old Testament, right? I'm not asking for any mythological creatures or legends, but I'd like something. For all I know, there are fishes, there are sharks, there are squids, or any other type of creature just a few feet away from my only portal into the darkness outside my cabin. And exactly due to that darkness, I can't see what in the abyss is staring back at me. I'm no longer afraid of what could be inside the darkness. I'm, af I'm afraid that there's nothing. Entry 23. Dripping sound is speeding up. In addition, the metal surrounding me keeps groaning under the stress. Fear I don't I don't have long before I run out of supplies or or I'll be crushed by the sea. I've had nothing but time here to think about what would be a worse way to go, you know. On one hand, you have wasting away. My body's slowly losing all its strength to the point where I I can't do anything anymore. So think about food or water or sleep. In reality, it wouldn't be that different from what I'm currently doing anyway. On the other hand, there's drowning, or, or dying of the pressure. I have no idea what would kill me first if there were to be a small entrance to the cold outside. At least I imagine that if it was the pressure, it'd be fast. I mean, Satan is dying in space, right? Except the opposite. Kind of like... An implosion, maybe. Drowning, though. That would be horrible. Your feeling of needing to breathe, but only getting more and more water stuck in your lungs must be... Must be painful beyond all description. Thinking about this makes me realize there... There truly is no way out of here. At least I'd like to get it over with quickly. Entry 27. At some point in this, one cannot help but conclude that the rescue is no longer coming. You know, I've I've suffered enough for a lifetime, and if, if there is a hell, can't be worse than this. I'm Samuel Rodriguez, 24 years old, from Tampa, Florida. I joined the U.S. Navy back in 2012 to pay for college. Never once did I expect to be sent to the North Atlantic, and never... And even less so than I have that ship sink and leave me stranded at the bottom of the fucking ocean for over four weeks alone. The best way to describe my predicament, the ocean makes you feel alone and helpless. We weren't meant to traverse the ocean, much less be underneath the waves. I was never afraid of the water or, or of the sea. When I was a boy, my father took me out to sail more times than I could count. And I was always a good swimmer, but if I make it out of this alive, I swear. I swear I'll never touch the sea again in my life. I'm done with it. The sea, the ocean, they can fuck off. You know, aside from my immediate family, I won't be missed. A few friends, sure, but... But nothing close. I didn't have a girl back home either. Went on a date with one, though, and before I left for the Big Blue, I didn't even like her. <laughs> I, just, I just didn't. I just didn't want to be alone. And in hindsight, I should have listened to my mom. I should have gotten a trade job. Would have been uh, It would have been boring, maybe, but at least I didn't have to go into debt or die at the bottom of the goddamn ocean to pay for a fucking law degree. If these notes are ever found, 
let my parents, Carlos and Linda Rodriguez, know that I love them. And that I am proud to be their son. I know that they did their best for me, and for that... For that, I can't... I can't be more grateful. Entry 28. Yeah, I've been thinking. It's been a few hours since my last entry, and I'm... I'm writing this by fire. I've narrowed down what caused the ship crash in the first place to either a drift, ice, or sea quake. If it is the former, then it's just a huge fucking cliche. <laughs> Has my life really come down to an extra in Titanic? I'm afraid so. You know. Unless I forgot to write it down, there weren't any aftershocks, so a sea quake seems unlikely. Maybe sea quakes don't have aftershocks like earthquakes do. Well, it shouldn't be that different. Hard to tell from up there. All I remember clearly was a crashing sound. Ship rocking, alarms going off. I thought about those minutes a million times the past few weeks. Storms aren't that uncommon in the North Atlantic either. Maybe it was that. Always cloudy and misty. Winds there nonstop. I can't believe I even started missing that cold that me and my mates on the ship always used to complain about. Entry 29. Food's running low. Water ran out just yesterday. I'm using the fire to try to boil the seawater and make it drinkable, but, you know, it doesn't work. I'm thirsty. It well and truly is the end of the road for me. The air's getting thinner. The ocean makes everyone powerless. If I want to go out on my own terms, I still have that box cutter I used to open the boxes. Place these notes in a container along with my dog tags. If it's ever found, you know. Please give them to my parents, but I'm not I'm not counting on it. I'll die a useless death. Miles under the sea in the pitch black darkness of the fucking ocean. I hate this place. Can't believe this is the end for me. We weren't made to be out here. At least in the forest or in the desert, you can still move, right? You can still hear. You can think of something, some way to survive longer than, than this. People have been living in those places for millennia. Out here, though? Out here, they said the Vikings were the first to sail to America on relatively small ships compared to what Columbus used. I can't imagine how they did it, let alone survive one storm in those ships. You say the ocean's the biggest graveyard on the planet for a reason, and I... I can't agree with those people more. Some scientists would kill for the opportunity to study the life around me, but for as far as I can tell, there isn't any. I should have stayed back home in Tampa. I miss my friends and my family. I was going sailing with my dad. Dumb arguments I had with my mom. I'm, I miss how my uncle would drop by whenever he pleased just to get some coffee and then and to move on with his day like usual. This isn't the type of loneliness you can just get out there in the world. It's something that I can't fully describe using my notes. No matter how you would try to, to s simulate it up there, it, it won't be the same. It's not something I'd wish upon my worst enemy. Okay, this is... This is it. My final act of defiance against all this. I may not have been in control during any of this. But I survived out here on my own means. And I'll die by him. Son. Samuel Rodriguez. Recently, my little brother got into hunting. The woods and camping were never something I ever enjoyed. I was more of an under-a-pile-of-blankets-with-a-book kind of guy. 
I wanted to support him in his new hobby, so I found myself saying that I would go with him and his wife on a weekend hunting trip. The day before we met, I felt a, a small cold coming on. By the time we got our camp set up and went into the woods to start hunting, I had a fever. My face flushed, the gray, rainy weather doing nothing to help it. My brother lent me a rifle, even though I'd never used one before, and I decided early on that I was not going to shoot anything. The head cold was a good excuse to do so. Obviously, I was against a tree, sniffling, feeling the effects of my fever when my brother shot something. I heard his wife gasp after something big in the distance thudded to the ground, and when I looked over at them both, I realized something was very wrong. Their faces pale and in shock of what had just happened. At first, I was convinced my brother accidentally shot someone. I looked off through the trees, trying to see what had collapsed. Spotting a white shape through the bush, I started forward, ready to help while the other two remained frozen to the spot. I arrived first to look at what my brother had killed. To my relief, it was a deer. Pure white, stood in awe of the beautiful coat of fur. I'd never seen a white deer before, and a pang of pain came to my chest over the fact that it was dead. Finally, my brother and his wife walked over, still pale. What is that? he asked in a hushed tone. I looked at him, confused about the question for a few seconds. I mean, it, it was a deer. How could he not see that? Looking over to it, I studied it again, trying to see what he meant. When my eyes landed on the deer's face, I... I finally started to understand the gravity of the situation. See, I know it had antlers, but for the life of me, I can't remember what the face looked like. My memory was a blur of white while staring right at it. My brain refused to actually see it. I took a few steps back then, scared out of my mind, and started thinking my fever was messing with my head. It doesn't make, doesn't make any sense, I said in a low voice between coughs. The deer in front of us was special. I mean, beyond special. My brother shot it. I looked at the wound that killed the poor thing to see pearl-shaded blood staining the wounds. My stomach twisted in regret, and I felt like I was about to... Like I was about to sob. I turned my head away, unable to keep looking at it. What should we do? His wife Kathy asked in a shaking voice. We shouldn't let the meat go to waste, my brother commented. I felt the entire forest fell still at his comment. It was as if the air itself stopped moving. It revolted me. It was terrible enough this creature was dead and my brother wanted to... to disrespect it further. I knew it was natural for animals to eat each other, and logically, it would be a waste to not eat this deer. However, I just instinctively knew this creature was never meant to be eaten. It was something that existed outside of the natural order, something powerful and yet fragile enough to be killed by a single bullet. Are you crazy? I hissed at him. Looking down at the white shape, I shook my feverish head. We'll let the forest take it. He reluctantly agreed. I put down the borrowed rifle and started to pick up fallen branches, my brother doing the same. Kathy gathered up wildflowers, and in a short while we covered the deer as a sign of respect. We could never take back killing it but we could show remorse. Without a word, we left the creature behind and with a heavy weight in our chests. When we arrived back in the camp, I was feeling so ill, I turned in the moment we got back. I bundled myself up in blankets and fell into a deep sleep, only waking to drink some water to ease my dry throat. My slight cough turned into a full-blown flu, and I was in no condition to walk out in the woods. When I woke again, it was morning, but still gray and cold. How are you feeling? Kathy asked me when I came out of my tent. Awful. What's the plan? I felt like my head was going to explode and my entire body was weak. She walked over and gave me a cup of hot tea, which was very much appreciated. We stick around until you feel better and the weather clears up. We should get you out of these woods, but it would nearly kill you if you walked through the rain to get to the truck. Stay inside your tent, keep warm and dry. You brought some books, right? I nodded, sipping at the tea. That sounded like a good enough plan. I hope my fever would only last another day and we could leave. What happened the day before really was freaking me out. The forest around us felt hostile. The wind howled through the trees and I suppressed a shudder. 
I took my tea back inside the tent and got wrapped up in blankets once more, but not feeling any warmer. The wind kept howling outside the tent. I prayed my flimsy tent would hold if a storm came rolling in. The rest of the day I drifted between trying to read and sleeping. I normally never felt sick, so it was hitting me extra hard. When Kathy tried waking me up to eat some soup, I was in such a deep sleep that I didn't even stir, so she left me alone to offer it later. The next day I was feeling much better and starving from not eating much the past few days. I had my backpack in my tent, so I opened it to find the hidden snack I'd stashed away. I ate an entire box of oatmeal bars before getting outside of my tent. When I went outside, the rain cleared up, but everything else was still damp. Kathy was outside, trying to keep the fire going. Feeling any better? She asked me, looking and sounding exhausted. Yeah, a bit. I think we could leave sometime today if it doesn't start raining again, I offered. She looked between me and her tent, worried. Clearing her throat, she shook her head. James isn't feeling well. I think he caught your cold. Let's see how he is in a few hours. I felt bad that my brother was sick, now suffering through what I just did. I'd delay us leaving, but there was nothing I could do about it. I saw that we were out of firewood and I needed to get some air, so... Hey, I'll get us some firewood. It'll give me something to do. I'll check on him in a few hours, make sure that he's eating. Kathy gave me a grateful smile. From how bad she looked, I wondered if she'd gotten sick too. I left into the woods, trying my best to find anything that wasn't too damp to burn. I found some sticks hidden under leaves and logs that should be dry enough. I was the type to get lost easy, so I needed to stick around the camp. After I collected an armful of good enough wood, I was about ready to head back when something out of the corner of my eyes made me stop. On a bush was a few drips of shimmering liquid. I walked up to it to get a better look, not understanding what I was looking at. I was drawn away by the sound of retching off towards the camp. Forgetting about the strange liquid, I started back to check up on my brother and Kathy. When I arrived back, the rain started again, making it too wet for us to start the fire back up. Kathy was looking pale and chilled down to the bone. I wish the cold, damp weather would pass so that we could finally leave. I started to wonder if I should take my brother's truck and maybe get some help. My fever hadn't gone down entirely, and we parked so far away, I, I feared that I would get too ill if I braved the hike through the woods. Hey, uh, is everything all right? I asked. I put the wood away, covering it with plastic, hoping for it to stay dry. Kathy looked at me, a worried expression on her face. Before she could answer, my brother came out of his tent. It should have been impossible, but he looked looked paler than Kathy, his skin nearly void of any color. I decided then that I would try to get some help. We needed to get the hell out of the woods. Hey James, uh, give me your keys please, I said, holding on my hand for him to give me his truck keys from his pocket. He looked over at me as if I was speaking a different language. Shaking his head, he took a sip of water from a flask that Kathy handed to him. She looked scared stiff. James felt different. It's the way he was moving and not really looking at us. No, no, just give me another few hours to sleep, then we'll all go. I never should have given in. I slowly brought my hand back, trying to think of an argument. Truthfully, I was frightened to go into the woods alone. Just, just a few more hours, then we wouldn't even pack up our gear. We would just leave. James took Kathy's hand and they went back into their tent. Not being able to think of anything else to do, I went back into mine to get dry and warm. I was going to finish the last hundred pages of a book to give my brother time to sleep. I drifted off while I was reading. One moment I had a book in my hand, and the other, I was waking up in a pitch darkness. I sat up confused at what time it was. Slowly my eyes adjusted and I could see a hint of light coming through the tent, slipping back into the cold, damp outside world... I looked over to see a very weak fire burning. My brother stood just within the light. I opened my mouth to call out to him, but something felt wrong. I, I couldn't place it. The air was tense. My stomach muscles started to lock up. Hearing me coming from my tent, my brother turned to look at me. He still looked pale as death. His face is the same. But I just knew in that moment I was no longer looking at my brother. He took steps towards me. An unknown purpose in his stride. I, I, I ran. Without any plan, I ran off into the woods trying to get away from whatever he had become. I was only running for a few minutes when I saw the lights of a fire between the trees. It was
was faint, but I ran towards it, praying someone would help. I didn't think anyone was camping so close to us and was thankful for it. I ran into the clearing, but my blood froze in my veins. It, it wasn't a new campsite, it was ours. I just ran back, and even though I, I was positive, I ran straight. My brother stood by the dying coals, the orange light shining in his eyes. I ran again. It was dark, and the woods was just a maze of trees. It was understandable that I got turned around. A few more minutes of running, and I came crashing into our campsite again. In a blind panic, I just kept going. No matter what direction I took, I would always end up running towards our camp. My brother standing, silently watching me, attempting and failing to escape. When I couldn't run anymore, I collapsed, gasping for air. I didn't understand what was going on. All I knew was I could no longer leave. Please, I begged the pale figure. It was too late to save my brother, but if there was even a hint of him left, he would let me and Kathy leave. His face was going out of focus. For whatever reason, my brain was refusing to see what it truly looked like. Let me and Kathy leave. I sat on the cold ground, shaking in fear. Deep down, I knew my brother wasn't changing into something beyond my understanding simply because he shot a strange deer. My suspicions I, I couldn't bear to say out loud was confirmed by him when he finally spoke in a raspy voice. I cannot let her go. After all, she ate some of it, too. My stomach sank. I, I felt like I was going to be sick. Killing the white deer by accident could be forgiven, but cutting into its body to devour the flesh could not. The thing that was once my brother lunged at me. He grabbed me by the neck as I struggled desperately to get free. I got as far as the dying fire pile before he held me still, his strength far beyond my own. I kicked, I screamed, trying to pry him away from me. I couldn't see his face clearly, but I saw his mouth. Oh God, whatever he became was something no human should ever see. It it opened wide, with countless teeth shining in the dying firelight. He had turned into something so twisted because of his unforgivable sin. I was only saved because I thought for a brief moment I saw a white figure behind my brother urging me to fight. I had nothing to lose. I reached over to the nearby coals, the fear causing me to ignore the pain of grabbing coals and ash to toss into the creature's face. He let out a scream of pain and let me go. I, I wasted no time scrambling free, but paused at the edge of the camp. I watched in horrified fascination as the thing that was once my brother screamed and thrashed, sickening cracking sounds coming from his body as he started to turn from human into something completely different. Twisted with long, pale limbs, I... I... I couldn't stomach the sight. I almost couldn't stand the idea of leaving Kathy behind. But she was either already dead or or turning into the same thing. Inside of the tent and out of sight, I felt trapped. I knew if I left, I would end up back in the camp again. Off in the distance, I saw a hint of white through the trees, and I, I ran toward it. As I ran, I heard the monster I left behind screaming at me to stay. This time, instead of looping back around, I noticed a hint of shimmering liquid on the ground, and I followed it. Drop by drop, I kept, I kept going until my lungs felt like they were going to burst, and my legs burned. The force around me started to get lighter, until I found myself running right into a snow-covered parking lot. I collapsed again, feeling weak, and the snow soaked through my jeans. It wasn't the season for snow. The parking lot was right next to the ranger station, and when I came running out exhausted, the ranger saw me and came outside to see what was going on. I couldn't keep myself awake until he got to me, and I passed out in the slush. In the end, they never found James and Kathy. They found our abandoned campsite months ago and assumed us all dead. I could never tell them what really happened because, because I don't know myself. I don't feel as if this was all a dream, or if my mind just snapped. I'm certain my brother's now something else out there inside the woods. I wonder why I was saved. What creature decided to show me the right way out? 
Was it the white deer because I didn't eat part of it? Or, or did it want me to live so that I could tell others about what happened? Whatever reason it might be, I'm thankful for my life. And if you're ever out there hunting, make certain you know what you're about to shoot before you pull the trigger or else, or else you'll make a mistake that's going to change your life forever. Good evening once again, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video, or for listening to tonight's episode of the podcast that's available on Spotify, or on Apple Music, or on uh, um, any, any other places that you can get podcasts. If you guys have loved any of the series you've been hearing on the channel, such as the Neverglade Mysteries, My Tiny Town Has Just Been Put on Lockdown, or Tales from the Gas Station, and you've wondered if there's more, there is. Take a look on Amazon. All these authors and many more have books available on Amazon right now, and some of them I've even done the audiobooks for. Check them out now, see if you can pick up a novel or two, and let them know that I sent you. As always, I want to give a big thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, and you allow us to get a whole bunch of custom stories that are only heard here on this channel, on this podcast. So, a very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krauss, Maria Walker, Tanya Oren, Payne Gravy, Inactive Hermit, Austin Johnson, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Aka Limchok, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Jabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, The Morgan, Nick Weaver, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, Sky Maria Ravenswood, William King, Reaper 61167, Darth Miver, Micah Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Parafa Panda, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Suzaku, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Miss Xander, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trey Smiles, and Corey Kenshin. And of course, everybody who's down there in the description as well, and everybody who can support on patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta for even one dollar. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for listening, and sweet dreams.